I have just almost no patience for that level of dialogue. Well, that that's that's really the the problem here, and I, I think one of the things is with with Nietzsche's idea of slave morality versus aristocratic morality. Aristocratic morality is the idea that you assert what you want without, you know, asking for permission or without, you know, seeking justification for it. It's just you just act on it. Whereas slave morality defines itself against someone else because one is powerless. And then by creating this sort of like foil in your mind or, you know, in your language that you can go up against, it's, it's quote unquote empowering. But you see, this is the kind of irony, right? Cause, cause a, that's what I see with a lot okay, not naming names, but that's what I see with the alt-right. A lot of the slave morality where there's resentment against Christians against, um, like you said, the racist for the atheist racist, they have all this resentment. Like that's not, that's literally the opposite of the overman. No, definitely. And, and I realized that slave morality is, is one of those, I guess, terms that's been almost rendered useless by repetition. You know, it's a quite useful term, really. But kind of anyone who's who's even, you know, just skimmed Nietzsche just calls the, the people they don't like slave morality. But that idea of kind of defining yourself in relation to someone else through almost through, through negation. You know, you see in other things like, for example, like Irish nationalism, you know, Palestinian activism, a lot of things like that. And I don't mean to say that there are no grievances in either of those causes. But to me, it doesn't seem like a particularly... I guess, useful mode of thought. And this is someone who would not consider himself a Nietzsche. Right. Well, because here's the deal, right? If you, if you do do that, then there's no victory condition because if the other side goes away, your identity goes away. And so you've actually sort of hamstrung yourself so that you can't actually win. Well, and I think that you see this specifically. And I spoke with Gio last night and after the show, we ended up talking till past midnight, which means that I not only did not get any sleep at all, but we we managed to blow out the actual episode by a factor of two or three off camera. But we were talking about essentially that that, that, that is very much the problem with Canadian identity, that essentially Canada exists essentially as a ultra blue United States state. You know, they view themselves exclusively as the better America, you know, the more progressive America. And so realistically, other than, you know, Tim Horton's maple syrup, and maybe ice hockey if you're really a chud out there in the woods. You know, the Canadian, the widespread, you know, Canadian identity is essentially being more true to quote unquote, like American principles, you know, human rights, you know, kind of those things like that than Americans. And you've seen very much that like, that's not, that's kind of weak gruel. You know, there's nothing really there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really weak. And, you know, back to your point about the online pagans, they're, they're just, we're the not Christians, we're the not blacks, we're the not progressives, we're just, you know, because, uh, again, if you, uh, the, the, these are people that haven't read Homer, right? And these are also people that haven't read the sagas, because, you know, again, well, there's certainly a lot of violence in the sagas, and, but the thing is, though, I'll, I'll, there's this, so when Christ says, live by the sword, die by the sword, one meaning of that is what we see in the sagas and in Homer. You, you live like this sooner or later it's going to catch up to you. And, you know, mo most people don't like it when it finally catches up to them. And so, but, but, but beyond that point, if you actually read the sagas, we read about these rooted uh, villages, you know, these people that actually have a, a lived culture and I don't see pagans actually trying to restore this. So let me give you a concrete example, right? At the end of Egil's saga, Egil's son Thorstein uh, comes of age, and so Egil has already placed aside for him land, home, servants, and livestock. All Thorstein has to do is find a wife, and then his clan can start under the broader umbrella of Egil. And then Thorstein gets in a property dispute with another clansman, and his father Egil, who's also you know famous for being a, a Viking warrior, comes to his aid. Okay, that's a lived, embodied community. Now. Do we see pagans doing that now? Well, and, and I think that I, I very much agree with you. And it's kind of my my internal barometer for kind of whose religion do I make fun of on the internet? Because to me, look, like I, I am within the kind of broader Christian sphere. I kind of take the, the Kierkegaard tact 
that past a certain point theology is counterintuitive. And I don't mean to say that it's not important to discuss, but for the vast majority of people, it is not worth your time. And so I'm not really willing to start kind of inter-Christian fights. And then outside of that, that kind of distinction of, you know, maintaining an active community. You know, if you are a, a practicing Hindu, and I don't really understand much about the the, con the, the structure of Hinduism. So if I miss misspeak, forgive me. But if you were a kind of a practicing Hindu in a community, I don't agree with you on kind of a, a, a level of truth claims, right? Like there's fundamentally different claims about the way that, you know, wider reality works. But at least in our current situation, that man, that man is not my enemy, right? Like we have, we have much bigger fishes to fry. But when you see these kind of, and this is very much present in the online Christian community as well, Right, like someone for whom religion essentially is a, you know, something you wear, you know, it's kind of like a, a part of your personal brand. Whereas, really, the thing that separates, you know, kind of like religion from the kind of, I, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, you know, kind of like vapid, uh, you know, guru mentality of that we saw so much in like the past, you know, 50 years, really, is that fact that it is embodied and it is communitarian. Right. Like short of, and I realize, look, like there've always been, you know, holy hermits. I'm not talking about those people, but there is something to a religion that it needs to be practiced and it needs to be community based because otherwise it really is just some things you vaguely think, you know, and then also I think that there's something that you, and obviously this is more literal in, in some religions than others, but if your religion places no limits on you, you know, what is it at that point? And so to me, right, if you don't have a series of beliefs, you know, that you practice in community with others and that place some kind of limits on your natural desires, to me, that's not, that kind of fails the, to meet the hurdle of being a religion in the first place, if you see what I mean. Right, right. Because if you don't meet the condition of being in community, you don't meet the condition of having some of the limits placed upon you, what is it? Well, it's, it's a fandom. That's yes, right. exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a fandom. That's a good way it's to put Star it. It's Star Trek. 